How do you recognize and seize opportunities that produce outsized transformational changes? I'll tell you my method of catching lightning in a bottle. You know how you watch somebody do something genius and you want to imitate their moves? That's what I'm talking about. And you know what I think helps me is that I know that the word genius comes from the Greek and the Greeks never called people geniuses, right? It's just too much of a burden. What they did is they called a genius a spirit that makes itself available to you and inspires you to do something that is really beyond your natural capabilities. So I feel the same way, only I don't call it a spirit, I call it the spirit, right? So how do you recognize a moment of genius? How do you seize a moment of genius? I'll tell you what I do. Uh, first of all, I look for what's something, something that feels inspired, as in, where did this come from? Is this really, this is, this is brilliant, and I know this is better than I can think, right? So something like that. Um, is it scary? It usually is scary for me, right? It's, I don't want to do it, oh, I don't want to do it. It's scary. I will fail, maybe I'll even succeed, and that's even scarier. The third one is that it, it sort of demands immediate action. It sort of, you know, it just pushes you, right? It just, it, or maybe somebody call it, we'll call it a burden. Something that is just on your shoulders and you have to, you, you're compelled to jump. So these are the signs that, okay, this might be a moment of genius, uh, might, might be a prompting of the spirit that, uh, that I have to listen to. Now, how do you uh, protect yourself, really, from from being, doing something that is impulsive, foolish, something that you'll regret? How do you dif differentiate an impulse uh, from a moment of genius? Okay, here it is. Questions. Does it harmonize with your deepest desires and your highest values? That's a great, great question to ask. Does it require courage, character, strategy, long-term thinking? Or is it more of a convenient, tactical, safe, quick fix type of thing, right? If it requires character, that's a good thing. Does you, can you deal with the worst that can happen? Usually that's a great way to work through fear in my mind is, okay, um, I have this opportunity and it might not go well. Can I deal with the aftermath? Can I, can I live with that? Is that? And most of the time, really, it's a primal fear, not a real fear. It doesn't reflect reality. So if you, if you imagine yourself in a situation of complete and <laughs> failure, and you go, you know what, that's, I can live with that. It's okay, you know? That's a good thing. And here's the fourth one, and this is really, really important. This is sort of my last line of defense, my last checkbox that I check if it's something significant. Does it resonate with your inner circle of trusted advisors, coaches, mentors, your spouse, whatever you want to call it, the people that you, that you love, that know you, that you respect, that guide you? If you, have those, if you don't have those people, you should get yourself an inner circle of people, right? Um, does it resonate with them or not? And if it does, that's a good sign. So for me, if it checks those boxes, it feels inspired, it's scary, it demands immediate action. And if I can answer those questions that sort of de-risk it for me, right? Does it harmonize with my highest desires and my values? Does it require courage and strategy, long-term thinking? Can I deal with the aftermath if it doesn't, doesn't pan out? And does it resonate with my inner circle? If it checks out, then I usually jump. So I'll give you four stories that basically reflect how these principles have helped me tremendously in life in a variety of scenarios. Here are my four stories. Story number one, my earliest one, early 20s, I'm an aspiring artist. I'm at this party that I snuck into with, with a bunch of industry people, some celebrities, etc. I'm sort of socializing and somebody walks up to me out of nowhere he looks like a record executive and he is a record executive at the time you couldn't record music at home you could only record it in a professional studio that's the only shot you got so he comes over and he goes are you an artist i said yeah uh, and he goes you know you might you might look like you might look good on stage do you i have a studio if i give you a shot um who's gonna who's gonna write the music I, i'm like i'm gonna write the music he goes really i go yeah 
who's gonna write the lyrics? I'm gonna write the lyrics. He goes, really? Yeah. Okay, well, why don't you give me a call? Here's my number. Come over to the studio. We'll see what you got. I went home, of course, wrote a couple of songs, music and lyrics. I had never written a song, never written a, lyrics, a lyric before that. Technically, I was not lying because he didn't ask me if I'm any good at it, uh, but I seized the opportunity. And I ended up being on national television in about a year, having a record con uh, contract and selling millions of albums over my decade-long career as an artist. Story number two, we're in Los Angeles. Deb and I, um, my wife and I, we decide to start a production company. And the idea was, is to work with European artists because these, this is the, the world that I had connections in and to work with high level Hollywood producers of music and music videos, which is Deb's background because she used to work for MTV and VH1. We started the company, we started a website, we have nothing. The list of the things that we don't have, crews, contracts, lawyers, insurance, is way, way longer than the list that we do have. Some expertise in a website. And then we just go for it. And a week after that happens, somebody calls me, an artist, says, can you do this? I said, absolutely. What's the budget? The person goes $150,000, which I never dreamt to have a budget like that as a first project. I said, absolutely, we'll take care of it. And we did, we created an amazing video. Um, $450,000, that was our first project in our new production company. And it all did happen sort of supernaturally, you know? And that's the reason I bring it up to you, is that there's things in motion that if you can pay attention to them, and if you listen carefully uh, and lean into them, they can have transformational outcomes. It doesn't all have to be related to money or business or commercial activity at all. I'll give you two more stories that are non-related to business at all. The first one is a creative idea, right? So Deb and I are on a bike ride and we go on bike rides very regularly. And I say, hey, you know, I listen to this um, spoken word piece and um, it's about faith being like a dance with God. And if you follow his lead, it, it just goes well for you. It's a beautiful imagery. And I, thought, and I thought maybe, you know, we can create some sort of music video that reflects that just as a creative thing, right? And she goes, aren't we going to, you know, Europe in, in a month on a mission trip? I, get, I go, yeah. Aren't some of the best dancers in the world, ballet dancers there? Don't you know some people? I said, yeah. She goes, why don't you just create a short film? Just write a script and actually create a short film with dialogue and everything. Again, it's an idea. The list of the things that we don't have is way longer than the things that we do have, which is a bike ride and idea. <laughs> and I go, okay, honey, I, I, can, I think we can try, you know, and I go home and I spend four hours, I write a script for a 15 minute short film in four hours. We end up having a crew, full film gear, miraculously, I'm going to tell you all the details. We shoot the film in four days and we need a title song. So we wrote and recorded a song in two different languages in another four hours and we released this, this short film. It was just a, a passion project and it was accepted into quite a few short film festivals. We would have applied for more. It was probably it would be accepted in more. And uh, it was a remarkable experience that was just brilliant. And we shot it at the Bolshoi Theater, which is the most prestigious ballet theater in the world. The prima ballerina choreographed it for us. The two, one of the two leading soloists uh, played in, in, the, in the film for us um, and it was an amazing experience and one of my favorite stories is that my business partner Brandon and his wife Nicole he proposed to Nicole at the premiere here in Austin Texas at this big film festival uh, where you know they would interview the filmmaker show the film and then the next filmmaker then show the film it was short films right and then after our interview we had the opportunity to, we sort of had a secret pact with the organizers of the festival. And then Brandon, my, one of my favorite people in the whole world, he proposed to Nicole. The film was Dance With Me. And of course, they love dancing. So he had a dance with her.
My fourth story is the Ukraine Relief Network, which happened as of the filming of this film, maybe like three months ago, right? Three and a half months ago. Uh, when the war in Ukraine broke out, uh, of course, I had spent so much time in Russia and Ukraine. My youngest daughter was born in Ukraine. Um, we were, all of us were horrified. I think the world was horrified, but people who have lived there were horrified. So I am just really wrestling, right, with this. And I'm wrestling with this idea that I have to do something. And, and I don't have time and I don't have the money. And, and I'm already overstretched, but I have to do something. So we're going to this event again with Brandon, Brandon Nicely, my business partner. And, and I'm telling you, I'm sort of pouring my soul in, you know, pouring my, my heart out. And I'm saying, look, I'm really, really sad, really distraught. And I feel like I have to do something and I feel guilty because we have so much to do on all kinds of arenas and I'm too busy. I just don't know, have, I don't have the bandwidth. And I don't even know if I can do, have an impact on this thing, right? And, and Brandon turns to me and he goes, Christian, for, for such a time as this, you have to go do it. Uh, again, the inner circle confirmation, right? Talk to my wife, she says the same thing. A cup, cup to, a cup, talk to a couple of other people, they say the same thing. So I just basically go ahead and we launched the Ukraine Relief Network and uh, we build a website, we, we build a program to help refugees in a matter of days. By day six, we had the first donations coming in and the first refugees were being helped. We ended up raising over a quarter of a million dollars in just two months and helping hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of refugees in Ukraine who were in danger for their life, in, in danger, th their life was in danger. I'm telling you this because this moment of opportunity can come out of nowhere. And it, sometimes it's business, sometimes it's creativity, sometimes it's serving the poor and the needy. And I really feel like a lot of the time we just miss out on this moment of genius, this window just closes. Um, just because we have fear, just because we feel that we're not capable of doing something, and just because we don't have enough advisors and coaches and mentors around us to spur us forward. So let me ask you, have you ever experienced this opportunity for genius and you either seized it or passed on it and why? And what would you do next time? Think about it, leave us some comments in the comment section.